Hi, welcome to 3104 NSC Cycle 3 Drug Design. My name is Mark Costa and I'm going to be teaching this part of the course to you. Uh, my lecture slide is going to be a bit different this trimester. There's going to be a lot of extra information in them. There's going to be some hyperlinks to interesting resources that you might find useful. And uh, an example of this is the first slide here. So I've got a link to my website, mcosta.net. I've got a link to my uh, Twitter feed. And also I've got a link to the Course Hub website for this course where I'm going to be posting these lecture slides, videos supporting the course, and also a bunch of other useful information for the course. So what can we achieve through drug design? Uh, is it fame that interests you? Or is it, uh, are you more interested in making money and fortune? Or do you have altruistic interests? Uh, do you want to change the world and make it a better place? Well, the first of these, fame, I think can be really illustrated through one of the most famous chemists of the last century, Carl Gerasi. He's also known as the father of the pill, and that's the birth control pill. He was a chemist involved in the development of the oral contraceptive pill, which really changed society in the 1960s. It allowed women for the first time to take uh, control of their destiny in terms of their reproductive health and reproductive decisions and really changed the way that society uh, was back in the 1960s and, and to the present day. Now these slides, if you go to the, them online, you'll find that they're uh, three-dimensional. So in some cases, there's an arrow uh, just over uh, here. I'll get it right, there it is, a little arrow there. And you can follow some of these slides downward for more information. So this uh, particular slide leads to uh, some more information about Carl Durassi. He was an incredibly productive chemist. He published over 1,200 academic articles, which is a huge amount. Uh, he worked in both academia and industry throughout his whole career. He uh, set up companies, he commercialized research, he was a, um, a really uh, very productive member of staff at Stanford University and before that at other universities. Uh, but then following his career in academia and his uh, huge chemical impact, he then decided to uh, branch out into other areas and he started writing firstly novels and poetry. And the novels, most of his novels he termed science in fiction novels. So the, instead of science fiction novels, which were sort of speculating about where science might go in the future, science and fiction novels looked at the human aspects of scientists working in their lab environment or in their scientific uh, field and looking at uh, how they interacted with people and the problems and the dilemmas that they faced. And uh, he continued in his interest in, in reproduction and reproductive health and thing covered issues such as uh, how uh, people would uh, conceive babies and how um, they would choose babies, uh, maybe designer babies in the future. Um, he wrote four autobiographies and uh, he also then went on to write uh, many plays. So he wrote nine uh, plays which are largely science and theatre. So they really looked at, once again, scientists working and the dilemmas they faced and so on. Now, what about if you're more interested in the monetary aspect of drug discovery? Um, so let's illustrate this with the example of Lipitor. So Lipitor, uh, which is the brand name for atorvastatin, is the highest selling drug of all time. It, uh, up to about a year or so ago, it had lifetime sales of $148 billion, which is an absolutely massive amount of money. There's the structure up there, um, and there's a picture of some packaging for Lipitor. So once again, there's more information if you go down from that slide. I've got a slide with a bit more information about Lipitor here. So it's a statin. You might have heard of the statins. They're a particular type of uh, drug used to treat uh, cardiovascular disease or to prevent it. They lower the bad lipids, uh, the low density lipoproteins in the blood. And uh, they do this by inhibiting a enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And uh, you'll find in some of my slides, I'm trying to put in some uh, interactive elements. So you've got an interactive uh, protein structure of HMG-CoA here. And if you zoom, on, zoom in on that, you might be able to find the actual uh, Lipitor um, bound into the active site of this particular enzyme. So um, that's fame and fortune. What about altruism? How can you make a global impact and help the world through drug discovery? Well, let's take the example of HIV AIDS. So here's a graph from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. And it's not particularly recent, but it really shows how um, a particular drug can make a huge difference to 
um, a disease. So HIV in the 1980s and into the 1990s was a huge uh, pro global health problem. Uh, countries around the world really didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, scientists got onto the problem very quickly and started using rational drug design to try to design new drugs to fight against this terrible disease. And you can see with the introduction of a particular type of therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy, this is usually a combination of different drugs that target different enzymes within the life cycle of the virus. When that got introduced, you can see in the chart here, there's a dramatic drop off in deaths due to HIV. And uh, I guess commensurate with that, there was um, an uptick in the number of people living with the disease because now lifespan was greatly extended uh, for those people living with HIV. So as you can see, HIV is really a treatable disease now. And most people who have HIV in the developed world will actually die with the disease rather than of the disease. It hasn't eradicated HIV, but it has definitely extended the lifespan of millions of people worldwide. What about HIV on the global stage? Well, unfortunately, the treatments have taken longer to get to people in the developing world. And so there's been a delay. And as you can see here, the um, number of people living with HIV has gone up. The number of deaths has gone down, but it's in the 2000s that this has occurred. And it's largely through developed countries supplying HIV drugs through aid. So there's definitely still a big unmet need uh, for you if you want to get involved in uh, altruistic uh, drug discovery to design and develop better anti-HIV drugs. Altruism, uh, in terms of drug discovery, you can also look at this in terms of testicular cancer. Before the 1960s, metastatic testicular cancer was one of the biggest killers of young men. Uh, in fact, uh, testicular cancer for those who have metastatic testicular cancer, the survival was less than 10% after one year. It's an incredibly aggressive disease. However, it's also one of the most treatable diseases now with modern chemotherapy. So with advances in not just chemotherapy, but also surgery and radiation, over 95% of patients with the disease are cured. That means no relapse. After five, 10 years, there's no sign of the disease. So it's really helped out millions of uh, young men around the world who've developed testicular cancer and been treated successfully with modern chemotherapies. So where else does drug design make a huge impact? Malaria is one area where there's been a, a huge impact of drug discovery and drug design. Malaria is still a huge problem around the world. There's hundreds of thousands of people uh, get malaria each year and uh, many of the most vulnerable amongst those, particularly pregnant women and children, uh, die. So the number of deaths around the world are falling, but are still way too high. The current goal of malaria researchers is for complete eradication. And this is going to take a massive effort from a number of different angles. It's going to require better mosquito control, better delivery of mosquito nets to affected areas. It could require the development of a vaccine, which is a huge challenge, but it's definitely going to require the development of new anti-malarial compounds because the anti-malarial agents that we have at the moment all of them are seeing resistance being developed by the parasite. So we need to continually be one step ahead of the parasite to develop new antimalarial drugs. So hopefully this gives you a bit of a feeling for why I think the drug design and drug discovery is important. So how does synthesis come into the equation? Well, organic synthesis plays a really vital role in modern drug discovery. We can't really do it without organic synthesis. Despite advances in fields like biologics, most drugs are still small organic molecules, and that's roughly underneath about a molecular weight of 900. And so really my point that I want to get across to you is that if you can't make anything, you can't do anything. In a sense, no one has ever been cured by virtual medicine. We can go to a computer and design drugs, but until we've actually made it in the lab, tested it, and then put it into clinical trials, it's never going to cure anyone of a disease until it's an actual compound in someone's hands. And that has been made by medicinal chemists. So this pie chart up here shows the origin of various drugs. Anything with an S in it is synthetic in origin. So we've got compounds that are purely synthetic. We've got compounds that are based on natural products but are somehow derivatives of the natural products through synthesis, or synthetic compounds that were inspired by natural products. And the majority of compounds on that pie chart are synthetic in, in origin. 
The B is for biologics, the V is for vaccines, and everything else is either natural products uh, or natural product derived or purely synthetic compounds. So most drugs are still, still derived through synthesis in some way or another. In fact, some of the biologics are, are involve synthesis as well. We might need to actually synthetically combine a biomolecule with a small molecule to get a, what is, would be then called a biologic, biological. Uh, or even some vaccines are synthetic these days. So you can actually make vaccines through synthesis to make the particular uh, compound that you're interested in, even though it's biological in, in its mechanism of action. So to summarize, whether your interest is in fame, fortune, or altruistic uh, motives, drug discovery allows you to make a major global impact. And I really want to stress that without synthesis, there is no fame, there is no fortune, and there's no humanitarian impact. Thanks.